Well, Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. You didn't get it? You get it now? Okay. You'll laugh later harder than you did now. That's a pretty good joke. It was Randy Casey told me the joke, and I remember it to this day. This guy went to prison, and his first day in prison, and he's really nervous, and he's in prison lunchroom and eating his lunch, and somebody hollers out, 48! And everybody started laughing. And after that laughter died down, another guy jumped up and said, 84! People were laughing. So he gets back to his cell and asks his bunkmate, he said, what's the deal with everybody laughing at the number? And the guy said, well, you know, most of us guys are in here for life. We've heard every joke that's ever been told. And we kind of got to where we don't like telling them anymore, but when we remember it, we, got, we gave them all the number. Sometimes something come up and we remember the joke and we'll say the number. Everybody knows what number joke that is and they'll laugh at it. And the guy said, well, I'm gonna try that. So the next day at lunch, he's in the cafeteria, Nobody says anything, so he jumps up and says, 14! And everybody just kept eating. Nobody laughed. And he said, well, maybe that wasn't a funny one. And he said, 36! Nobody just, everybody kind of looked at him funny, you know. And he said, well, I'm going to try one more. <clears throat> 87! Nobody laughed. He sat down. He asked his cellmate. He said, what's the deal? Nobody's laughing. And his cellmate said, well, some people can tell him, some people can't. You told me that joke back in 1979, I think. I remembered it to this day. Yeah, it was old then. That was number 42, if I remember right. Amen. Let's read Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, and uh, go through 5. We're going to deal with Jericho for a little while. And uh, this is uh, still talking about some things in the Bible some people don't believe. Do you believe that... The floodwaters covered the earth all, all the way up higher than the highest mountain. Okay, you believe God created the universe in six days, evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, the third day. Okay, you got to. We're, going to, we're believing in a new creation. Let's believe in the old creation. Let's believe the way God did it. Scholars doubt that there was ever a city called Jericho where the walls fell. The archaeologists doubt that. And yet, Jericho is a very, very important uh, city in the Bible as far as God revealing how He works, what He does, and so on. <clears throat> so let's read it. Joshua chapter 6. <clears throat> I think I've told so many bad jokes. I'm losing my voice now. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Do you believe what God said? Amen. Let's go to the Lord and ask God for wisdom tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. Thank you for this book. <clears throat> Lord, it is ever present in our lives. Lord, I can't preach but what the book says. I can't teach. I can't meditate. I can't think except for what this book says. Father, these people that you've given for me to lead, Lord, they've come seeking manna from heaven. They don't want to hear what Mike Hoggard says or thinks. They want to know, God, and beyond any doubt, that this is what you said, and this is, thus saith the Lord. And they believe it. 
I pray, dear God, that you would just encourage us, that you would help us, God, with believing what the Bible says and give us understanding of what the Bible says. And then, Lord, you'll apply it as we seek out wisdom for our lives. Father, we thank you, God, that the stories and the things that are in the Bible, Lord, can be preached in many ways, many levels. And Father, we'll never run out of things to preach on if we just stick to your word. And Father, just help us that. Bless us, dear God, and give us some wisdom, give us some understanding. Lord, maybe somebody this week's hurting, struggling. Maybe their things are not so well, Lord. And they're just seeking you for answers. I pray, dear God, that something that I say tonight would be an encouragement and a blessing to them. Father, more so than what I have the ability to give, may your Holy Spirit bless your word. Teach us great and mighty things that we know not. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> now, I mentioned there the believability of the story of Joshua in the battle at Jericho. I want you to notice there, as you look in Joshua chapter 6, I want you to notice there, he says in verse 3, that God wanted them to do something very specific. And the why of what God wanted them to do, I think, can be found in the Scriptures. And I think the symbolism of it, the meaning of it, can be found in the Scriptures. He told them in verse 3, they're going to compass the city. You know what that is, right? You're going to walk around that city, all the men of war. They're going to go about once, and they're, every morning they're going to get up, and they're going to line up. And the soldiers are going to be a certain place. The priest with the uh, ram's horns, the trumpets, are going to be in a certain place. I think the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be... Uh, the Bible says R-E-R-E-W-A-R-D. -E -E I thought that was re-reward, and I didn't understand that word, and I looked it up, and it's rearward. Instead of forward, it was rearward. And I went, oh, well, that's simple. So they put it in the back. But every day, they got up, they lined up, and you can imagine those men on those towers there around Jericho, they're prepared for war. They know it's going to break out any minute. And they see those men of war and they're marching around that city and they're blowing the trumpets and they got that big golden box there at the back of it. And when they marched around it, they walked away and went back to their camp. And the soldiers there in Jericho are probably going, these people are crazy. They were, I, I bet they were ready for war. They were armed and on that wall and ready for war. And all those guys did was walk around at once and then go back and camp. So they stood there in their post all day long. And then they thought, ah, they're just playing with us. So probably they were there all night too watching. The next morning, sure enough, lined up exactly the same. Walked around that city blowing those ram's horns, blowing those trumpets. All those men of war ready for war and that Ark of the Covenant, which they probably didn't know what that was. But here that thing was going around again. And they're ready for war, and those guys walked away and went back to their camp. Day three, same thing. Day four, same thing. Day five, same thing. Day six, same thing. One time a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, and you can imagine Jericho's probably going, we're going to do this again. And they're all on the wall. Because I want you to think about this. They've done this now six days. And they're figuring, at some point, those guys are going to rush us. So I'm just guessing here, but couldn't it be that just about every fighting man in Jericho was right there on those walls waiting? So they marched around that city one time, and they're going, okay, we've seen this before. And then they did it again, two times, three times. Only this time, they're marching around that city, they're blowing those trumpets and they're shouting. Arr! Whatever it was they're shouting, they're shouting, making a big noise. When they marched around that city the seventh time, I imagine probably to the second, they made a full circle around that city. All of that huge wall that they had built around that city of Jericho and all those soldiers standing on it collapsed. And I can just, I can see it. I'd love to be a movie maker and make this movie as the men of Israel walked across the carcasses of those men that were on that wall who were crushed and went in and took that city. 
God made it that simple. Now, let's go back just for a minute. In Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 14, this was a pivotal time for Israel. Because God told Moses, select 12 men from each of the tribes, send them into the promised land, 40 days, and when they come back, let them give you the report. God knew what was going to happen there. He knew it. And those 10 of those men came back and said, we can't go in there. The Bible calls what they said an evil report. Joshua and Caleb, the Bible says, had a different spirit in them. They had a spirit of belief. And they're pleading with the people of Israel, please, God said we can go in there. God said he would hand them into our hand. Now I want you to think about this. The people of Israel not only robbed themselves of the blessing of receiving the inheritance of the promised land, they also robbed themselves of seeing what Jericho and his, or Joshua and his men saw on that seventh day. Those, because they mentioned in number 13, the evil report was these walls are built way up to heaven. There's no way we'll be able to get in there. They didn't know the power of God. God was able to, just like that, the Bible says, look at, the, look at your Bible. In verse 5, the wall of the city shall fall down how? Flat. I kind of see it like this. It didn't crumble because that would have left a pile. I think it creviced and split in certain places and just fell down flat or fell in flat. Killing anybody who would have been either on that wall or behind that wall. Killing them. And the people of Joshua's army just walked right over the top and took that city. Boy, I'd like to have been there to see that. Amen? And the people of Israel, 40 years prior to that, robbed themselves of the blessing of watching God do this thing because they were afraid and they refused to believe what God said. You can say what you want to. There is no salvation to people who don't believe God. You've got to believe what God said. Can I hear you say amen? Now, here's, here's my take on this. Walked around it one time a day, six days, seven times on the seventh day. Turn to first, Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. There are time prophecies in your Bible. And Peter said this. Uh, David mentioned it. We're going we're gonna to look at it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. And I want you to look at verse 9. I like verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you believe that? Say amen. Listen, you want to you call yourself a Christian? Then have the heart that Jesus has for lost people. God is not... We were talking about that this morning. Okay? The difference between Calvinism and what some other people believe. John Calvin believed in a limited atonement. Right here... God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God gave His beloved Son, His only begotten Son, to who? Only the good people? Only the saved people? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. I'm getting off my notes. Is that okay? It's fine with me. Ezekiel chapter 33. Look at verse, let's see here. Verse 7 of Ezekiel 33. So, so thou, O son of man, I set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will I require at thine hand. I'm going to tell you something. If we fail in this church to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, 
to lost sinners. If we fail to do that, their blood is on our hands. Let's preach the gospel. Amen? Let's preach the gospel. God will give you opportunities. Who in here, you know for a fact that God had you speak to a certain person about Jesus, about salvation, and you'd never planned on it, but just all of a sudden, God said, go talk to that person. Who in here has ever had that deal go on before? Now, I'll tell you something. You're missing out. You're missing out. I used to do this, and I don't know why I don't do it anymore. But usually at the end of Sunday morning service, I would, I would tell people, ask God to send somebody to you this week to witness to. Ask God. Do you know God will send them? And did you know that when you start talking about it, it will be the easiest thing you have ever done in your life. You know why? It's God talking. God's giving you the words. Okay? Lost people deserve to hear the gospel as much as you did. Because you were lost. Amen? So then look at um, verse 9. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his iniquity, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Um, verse 10. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, thus uh, speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, verse 11, here it is right here. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Underline that in your Bible. There's a contrast to that in the Bible where it says, beautiful in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. God attends every funeral on the planet. God is there at every funeral funeral. He is rejoicing when a saved sinner enters into the joy of the Lord. He rejoices. It's beautiful. It's precious in his sight. And he weeps at the death of lost people. He finds no pleasure in it. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of of Israel. Um, there's one more thing I want to point out to you here in Ezekiel 33, and then we'll move on. If you look in, uh, let's start in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, when I, bring the, when I bring the sword upon the land. Not if, when. Who in here can foresee a time when God would bring the sword to this country? We're not used to that. We're not like Germany or some Middle Eastern nation where they have whole neighborhoods that are still bombed out and they decided a long time ago to quit rebuilding them because they're, they're just, they bombed all the time. We've never had that before. The exception of 9-11, we have not had that. We're not used to that. But God, I would say most definitely, will bring a sword to this nation. Are you with me? When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he does what? Blow the trumpet and warn the people. You know what the trumpet is? Turn to Revelation 1. I'll show you what the trumpet is. You're going to like this. Revelation chapter 1, in verse um, 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a what? Trumpet. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. Now I'm going to stop right here. The trumpet is your Bible. It's the word of Jesus Christ. When you know people are dying and you know that their heart beats away from eternity, you see the sword coming to them. Sound the trumpet. Go to them with concern and care for their soul. Do it. If they see the love in you, they will respond. Now, they may not get saved. If they see the love in you, okay? If they see the love in you, they'll respond. Don't go to them saying, 
Oh, I heard you're dying, huh? Bet you're going to hell. Don't go to them that way. Go to them with love. But warn them. Go with concern in your voice. Look, I'm very concerned for you. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I met Jesus one day and he saved me from all my sins and I know I'm going to heaven. Do you know that you're going to heaven? Had to do that with our neighbor lady. She was dying of cancer. I'm just not, with people I know, I'm not good at starting that conversation. But she was over here at JMH dying of cancer. And I said, you know what? I know her, and I bet I'm the only preacher in the world that she knows and will listen to. And it's my duty to go to her and tell her. And I went and sat down with her, and I read the scripture, and I walked her through the Romans Road of Salvation, and she prayed and asked God to forgive her of her sins. Okay? I was, there was a, a lady that come to our church here years ago. Her brother, he wasn't but about, 20, 21 years old, dying of AIDS. He was a homosexual. And she told me, she said, he's up at St. John's Hospital, and he is asking me if my preacher would come talk to him. That man opened. Jesus knocked, and he opened the door. And you know what? I went over there, and it was the easiest thing in the world. I, God made me love that young man. And I talked to him about Jesus, and I asked him, I said, you know your lifestyle you're living is sinful, don't you? Yeah. And the AIDS had, gone, had advanced so much in him that he would talk for a while, but then he would stop because it just, he just couldn't think of words. It just, words were hard to get out sometimes. And I had, to, I had to help him pray when we were praying for salvation. But that man asked Jesus in his heart and asked Jesus to forgive all of his sins. And not too long after that, he was at his sister's house dying. He was on his last days. And his sister told me about it. And I said, I'll be over. And I went over there and talked to him. And he knew who I was. And he couldn't talk much. But he nodded his head. And I said, you still believe Jesus died for your sins? Yeah. I said, you still believe that God's grace is going to take you into heaven? Yeah. And two of his former lovers were there, Randy. And they said, We just think it's so wonderful that you're as open as you are and come with talk and be with us. And I knew what they were getting at. And I said, Hold on a minute. I wasn't mean to them. But I said, Let me tell, let me tell you why I'm here. I said, Your friend knew that he was months away from standing before a holy God. And he, I said he had a fear and a reverence for God and His ways. And the Bible says that we are all sinners. And I said, he may not be able to say it a certain way, but I'm telling you, he renounced his lifestyle to me, to his sister, and to God. And God has forgiven him of those sins and trespasses. And God will forgive you also. That's the last time they ever got around me. They were at the funeral, and them and a militant lesbian wanted to put AIDS things all around the church. And I went, uh uh. This is not going to turn into a cause. We're going to talk about Jesus. Amen? But if you see the sword coming in somebody's life, and you. Ask God to help you. God will help you go and talk to these people. Okay? Don't be worried that you don't, you're not, you don't know enough of the Bible. You, don't, you know what God did for you, don't you? You know that God saved you, don't you? What does a witness do in a court? Tell what they know. That's what he's asking you to do is tell what you know. Amen? Okay. All right. Back to Second Peter. Beloved. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, 
the earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. The key part of this is how God is teaching you how time works in the Bible. A day equals a thousand years. A thousand years equals a day. We need a double witness to that. So let's go to Psalm chapter 90. Turn there in your Bible. Psalm 90. You can, uh, when you turn there, you can write 2 Peter chapter 3 next to it because that is your double witness. At the mouth of two witnesses or three shall every word be established. Now if I read something one time in the Bible and I think I get what it means, I'm not going to be satisfied until I read it again somewhere else. When I read it again, then I know that this is how God is because it's a double witness. Psalm 90 verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. So now watch this. God has established twice in your Bible a, a reference for the symbolism of time in the Bible. Did they literally spend six days marching around one time a day for six days? And on the seventh day, did they march around seven times? Absolutely. God didn't say, now just march around a few times. That's not what he said. God was very specific in what he wanted and what he asked. So he said, one time a day, six days, seven times on the seventh day. And, on that, and on, at that time, you're going to walk in Jericho. And God is establishing for you. I think Jericho represents Babylon the Great, the world's system, the world's powers... Because remember what Babylon has done. Babylon has a cup in her hand. And she has taken that cup and poured it out. And made drunk all the kings and, and governors and princes of this world. People, for the most part, who are in high places in governments all over the world. Most of these people, if not the vast majority of them, are lost and dying and go to hell. And who controls them? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She has deceived them. She has made them drunken with the wine of her fornication. It does not surprise me when you hear things like Bohemian Grove and different places like that where the very powerful people in the world go into a secret place and God only knows what goes on there. There was a deal come up a few years ago, if you remember, Bill Clinton's name came up and it did not surprise me at all. One of these very rich, wealthy, powerful media moguls from Britain had his own private island, a real nice house on there, and servants and caterers and prostitutes. And he would invite very wealthy, very rich, very powerful men from all over the globe, he would fly them in to his nice little island retreat where they could have anything they wanted. And Bill Clinton's name came up. He was one of those that was on that list that had flown out there. Do you remember hearing about that? Listen, that doesn't surprise me. It does not shock me at all. Babylon likes to please her boys but in that, she controls her boys. The Bible said Jezebel, who is a type of Babylon, she had 400 prophets that sat at her table. She took very good care of her boys. But she controlled her boys. She controlled what they said, what they prophesied, what they preached. She had control over that. She used the wine of her filthiness and her fornication to control them. All right? So, where was I going with that? That's pretty good. Oh, she's the one dominating the world scene. It is her spirit. Okay? She is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Anything that's wicked and abominable in God's sight, she's their mother. Okay? So, watch this. God is going to destroy her. God's going to bring her down. And so he says, he says it in Jeremiah 51, he says it in uh, Revelation 17, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What happened to Jericho? Jericho is fallen. Babylon is fallen. Jericho represents the, the governmental powers of this world 
and they are going to fall and perish getting ready for the return of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. With us, whipping and riding on white horses. Amen! So now watch this. Six days, 6,000 years. 6,000 years ago, roughly, somewhere around in there, God created the heaven and the earth. We know this by way of the genealogies of the Bible. People don't believe that. I can't help it. God's not wrong about anything that he said. Okay? So I don't need evolution to correct me. I don't need to know carbon-14 dating. I don't need any of that stuff. I know what the Bible says, and that's exactly what I believe. If you think I'm wrong, prove it. You go ask God. Okay? And then he'll tell me if I'm wrong or not. So six days, 6,000 years, and I figure we're somewhere close to the dawning of the seventh day. And on the seventh day, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And Joshua, look at, look at your Bible. Uh, back in Joshua, look at the language here. The people, in verse 5, shall ascend up, every man straight before him. Hey, we're going to ascend up some, one of these days. Amen? Now watch it. Go to Genesis chapter 2, if you would. Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at the significance of the seventh day. The seventh day. I'm going to turn you all into Seventh Day Adventists. Not really. Somebody was uh, watching the sermon this morning. I don't know if they did it knowingly or not. But they left. I don't know why I caught it, but I went in my office after Sunday school, I always do, and you know, we'll drink coffee and sit down for a minute. And I always share the, the public feed to my Facebook page. And I noticed people were making comments. I was reading them, and one guy had a, put a link to a website on there. And I'm going, I don't know this website. So I just took a minute and checked it out. And it had a lot to do with abortion, this and that and the other. They're against it. But then it had a whole big deal about worshiping on the Sabbath. And I wrote on there, I said, I don't know who put this on there, but I do not condone this stuff here. Okay? I don't... Ellen, you know where Ellen White got her... I'm getting off the hook here, but you know where Ellen White got her doctrine about the seventh day? An angel came down and transported her to heaven where she saw the Ten Commandments... And they were all in like right, real brilliant letters. But she said the fourth commandment was shining greater than all the rest of them. And she said that that angel told her that Jesus did nail the offenses of the Ten Commandments to the cross with the exception of the fourth commandment. You gotta be, you gotta, if you're going to be saved, you've got to keep the fourth commandment and only go to church on Saturday. And I went, though we are an angel from heaven preach you any other gospel, let him be accursed. She was in contact with a familiar spirit. That's witchcraft, people. Okay? And those people are deceived. You pray, if you know somebody on the seventh day, you pray for them. All right? But there is going to be the advent of Christ on the seventh day. That means he's coming back. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. So the meaning of the number seven is he finished things. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. So it, it's a number for completion. And, you know, Jared, when you get done with a roof, get it all nice and good and everything got, you go home, what do you do? Get ready to go the next day, probably. Okay, rest. You rest. You rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And I've had conversations with people about the seventh day. And they said, oh, it says right in the Bible, you've got to go to church on the seventh day. I said, read that to me. Read to me in the law where it says, I must worship only on one day and cannot worship on any other day of the week. Well, it says it in there. Not, no, it doesn't. And I just, I just get irritated at people. Turn to um, Hebrews chapter 4. There is a rest coming. When the law says... 
um, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, and the seventh day thou shalt rest. If you want to honor the Sabbath day and keep it, rest. I believe in that. I sure do. I believe you ought to rest. I believe that God gave you six days to work, and it was a gift from God to take a day and rest. Jesus said Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Even though, watch this now, God cursed us men with having to work and eat by the sweat of our face. See it? Okay? He still gave us grace in that he gave us a day to rest. And I believe you ought to pick a day and rest. Okay? I believe you ought to. I found myself coming to the church seven days a week for quite a while. And after a while, I, I said, I can't keep doing this. And it's like God said, I didn't tell you to do it. Take a day off. Rest. Okay? And normally, on Saturday, that's what I do. I take a day off. I take, I take a rest. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. There is a greater rest coming. Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest. And we just read that. God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Verse 5. And in this place again. If they shall enter into my rest. Verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. I, I just shared today with a, a preacher that I know. Uh, he was asking me things uh, about this. And I used the illustration of the Israelites in Numbers, Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. How they got to a certain place, they sent the spies in, they were ready to go into the promised land. The ten came back and said, we can't go. And God cursed them and let their carcasses die in the wilderness. He said, you're not going in. And he made them walk in a circle for 40 years. One year for each day they were gone for one reason, and that was unbelief. Everybody in this church, I believe with all my heart, you want to live the best life that you can according to God's ways. Can I hear you say amen? amen? You want holiness in your life, personal holiness. You want to stay away from sin. You want to stay away from sinners. You want to stay away from old habits, old friends, old things that we used to do. We want a clean life. We try to live a clean life. But it's just like I said this morning. Leaven is everywhere. And it don't take much. You know, Roy, if Roy was here, Roy would tell you, he doesn't drink cough medicine like NyQuil with alcohol in it. Why? A little leaven. A little leaven. He, he'd, he'd tell you. He said, Mike, if I knew that I could go home and on my way home buy me a bottle of Jack, and go home and sit down and take one drink of Jack Daniels and pour the rest of it down the drain and I would be okay from here on out. He said, I'd probably do it. But I know for a fact that if I even touch that stuff again, I'm going to be in it as deep as I ever was. I can't ever get around that stuff. That's his leaven. One little drink will turn into a whole lump of trouble for him. And everybody in this room and everybody listening to me online, there's a leaven with your name on it. There is a weakness in you and it is easy to get you to fall into sin again. Easy. Paul said that sin that so doth so easily beset us. 
There are things you have to stay away from. Amen? But, where was I going with that? Oh, I have to get back on track. The problem is, normally, we don't. It is easy. The devil knows it. And sometimes all it takes is just a little push. And there we are again. My salvation is not based upon what I did, what I do, or what I'm going to do. It is based upon do I believe. Do I believe. For by grace are ye saved, and grace in God's eyes omits any of our works. For by grace are you saved through Okay? It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What I'm doing tonight by preaching, I'm not preaching in order to obtain favor with God. I already have it. I don't pray to obtain favor from God. Lisa and I, God has taught us years ago about tithing. We don't tithe to gain favor with God. We already have the money in our bank. We already have God's favor. Every week I get a little bit more of God's favor in the form of a paycheck. I already have good things given to me. I don't give it back so I can get more. I give it back because God has already blessed me. And I love Him. I do what I do because I believe what I believe. And that's what your salvation is based on. That's God being good to you is because you believe and trust what He said. You believe those walls fell down flat, don't you? Okay? You believe all those things in the Bible. So watch this. Verse 6 again. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and to whom it was first preached, enter not in because of unbelief. Again... He limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Verse 8. Now, I want you to underline the word Jesus in this verse. Underline the word Jesus. It's not Jesus Christ. Who is it? Who do you think it is? Read that verse. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Joshua. Okay? It's Joshua. Joshua led Israel into the promised land. But after Joshua did, here's David still speaking of a day that God is going to give them to rest. The earthly promised land was not the fulfillment of God's true plan. Heaven, a new heaven and a new earth and Christ's kingdom on this earth is the fulfillment of that promise. It is the day of rest. It is going to be a thousand years long. And I believe it's going to be a thousand years long to the second. It's going to be a thousand years long. And that is the day of the Lord. It is the day of rest. And I am looking forward to entering into that day of rest. Somebody say amen. I'm ready to enter into a world where we're not worried about if nuclear missiles are going to be shooting across the sky. I look forward to a day when our women and children are not being raped, where drunks are not on the road anymore, where people are not shooting and killing one another, where we don't have to have bunkers underground and, and guns sticking out of all of our windows to defend our... I'm looking forward to a day when the sword is going to be beat into a plowshare. Looking forward to a day when politics are no longer what's important, but Christ and His Word and His people reigning on this earth, reigning in righteousness. When judges no longer are paid bribes behind the scene in order to rule a certain way. Including, I would say, Supreme Court judges. 
Listen, we're corrupt in our country from the top all the way down. And I believe that includes the Supreme Court, too. Those people are ruining America, ruining the Constitution. And I look forward to a day when we are delivered from all of that. Jesus is going to rule. He's going to rule this earth. He's going to do it with righteousness. He's going to do it perfectly. And Satan himself is going to be bound for a thousand years. Woo! That's why I'm not a millennial. A millennialism teaches that we're already in the millennial reign of Christ. Satan is already bound. Who, who in here believes that? I don't. I've had him running over too many people to believe that he's bound up right now. Amen? Let me finish this out and I'll let you go home. Verse, um, verse 9, for, well, verse 8, for if Jesus, Joshua, Jesus is the Latinized form of the Greek word Iesus, which is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew Yeshua. Does that make sense? It's in English. It goes from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English. But it means Joshua. Okay? Anyway. Verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his let us labor. See, we're still in the days of laboring, aren't we? There's still work to do, my friends. Let us, therefore, in, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of what? Unbelief. You believe what God said. You trust His Word. You're having a bad day, and here's your emotions. Telling you all kinds of garbage that's not true. Here's God's word. It's just, it's just like Ian. That coming up with that stuff, that was God. How do you kill yeast? Light. Oh. Why didn't I see that? Sometimes I do. It's God, why didn't you give me that? God said, I just did. You listened to it, didn't you? Okay? Listen. One of these days, you and I, God's going to wipe away all this crud and all this stuff. And he's going to let us enter into a day where we're going to leave all that behind. And it's worth the labor that you're going through now to get there. you got the emotions telling you one thing. What you need is you've got God's Word, the light coming on to drive away all the, to kill all the yeast, all the leaven. So that you think now the way God thinks and you believe what God says. It's very important to do that. Okay? Let's stand to our feet. Love you guys. We love you too, Pastor Mike. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Amen. Study the number 13. You'll have fun with that. Okay? Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you, God, for the work that you have given us. Lord, I've done a lot of work in this world, and I know, Lord, what it's like to be at the end of the day and looking back at what your hands have done and being satisfied with that, and I thank you for it, Lord. So I don't complain, Father, about the work that you've given us. You have been good enough, Father, to give us labor and work that feeds us, it feeds our family. We pay our bills, Lord, and we have a little fun on the side every now and then. So, Father, help us, dear God, to not begrudge the work and the labor that you have given to us. We understand, God, that we're sinners. We understand, God, that it's because of that that by the sweat of our face we're going to earn our bread. Father, we understand that, and we also understand, God, that there's going to be days where we're, we, just, we just get fed up with it and want to walk away. But, Father, we thank you for the labor that you've given us. And Father, in the vineyard of the Lord, in the field that's already white with harvest. Father, we thank you that you still allow us to labor and to work. And Father, there is still work to be done. There are families, God, that need to be fixed. Homes that are broken, that need mended. Father, there are lost people that need to be saved. Saved people, Lord, that are backslid. Hurting people, Lord, that need healing. 
devils that need to be cast out. The work, Father, is great, and the work is all around us. So, Father, we can see that we're nearing the end. Help us, dear God, with a, a last effort of strength and might and power to go about your business and to do the work that you've sent us here to do, like Jesus did. And Father, you'll give us our time of rest in due season. And we look forward to that day. I look forward to that day. Lord, bless your day of rest. Bless your holy Sabbath. That thousand years where Jesus will reign. Father, help us to look forward to that time, seeing that the labor that we do is going to be worth it. Bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.